and these are the, the 22 autosomal chromosomes. They're painted here with fluorescent color. They don't come this way. Uh, <coughs> we can now score them this way. Um, the, the individuals who are transmitting uh, these, these disorders uh, uh, can, can, can show you a very, very simple inheritance pattern, something as simple as blue eyes versus brown eyes, where the brown-eyed individual carries one dominant gene and one recessive gene and leads to the pattern where half of the kids have the same genetic composition as the brown-eyed parent and the others have the composition of the blue-eyed parent, giving you this transmission from one parent to about half of their offspring in each generation and giving you a family tree that shows this vertical pattern of inheritance. Again, individuals who have the gene can pass it on to one half of their kids. That's very simple to follow. You can see that very easily with your eye. But this is a study that was done by Gregor Mendel, the father of genetics back in the 1800s. And here it shows the extremely complicated pattern that can arise by trying to follow two genes that contribute to a trait. Uh, we have our advanced graduate students try to follow three genes contributing to a trait. I can't show you a cartoon of that. It's too complicated to try to show. But what I want you to try to imagine is the complexity of trying to follow four or ten genes, as we think is the case in these kind of diseases. And you get a pattern that's unrecognizably complex to chase down. Therefore, the approach that we've been taking for the past 20 years or so has been to focus on rare, uh, rare genetic mutations, not the common mutations, but rare ones that give you a picture, that give you a disease that looks just like the rare form of the disease. And the importance of this is not that the rare form of the disease that maybe affects one in 50,000 people is going to be a particularly important component, but that rare individual will illuminate for you the pathway by which you can make that common form of the disease. And this approach really does work. It's very much the approach, whoa, where am I at? It's very much the approach that we took uh, in looking at migraine, where migraine is the most common of the neurological diseases. It affects 12 to 15 percent of the individuals. Uh, uh, and it, it, it has a nebulous kind of phenotype. It's not an easy disease to recognize what's going on. But studying the three genes that cause familial hemiplegic migraine, a very, very rare subtype of migraine, uh, that we, we recently reviewed our work on that in Scientific American last year, uh, really sort of opens up the pathogenesis, makes the disease very, very different. And I just want to give you three examples from this. It reframed the way you think about migraine. Because in the textbooks, migraine is still referred to as a vascular headache, suggesting the pulsi pulsing of the blood vessels in the brain are in some way involved. But in fact, none of the genes that cause familial migraine are expressed in blood vessels at all. They're only expressed in neurons, in the brain cells. So that says migraine is not a vascular disease at all. It's really a neuronal disease. And you can take those same genes that have the migraine mutations and see that they have mutations in them, the same gene that cause seizures. So migraine is really much more closely related to seizures than it does to have anything to do with the vascular system. And finally, what that tells you is that seeing this relationship to seizures makes it reasonable to use the same medications that are used in seizures. And in fact, seizure medications are way more commonly used in migraine therapy these days than in, 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 uh, in the control of seizures, even though it's off-label. It's not something that's recommended. So it makes sense to develop new therapies based on this new pathogenesis. So, so the idea has been shown to be a useful approach. Well, finding mutations these days has become mind-bogglingly easy and rapid, and, and, and you're going to be blown away in the next couple of years with how much sequence information is going to come about. Reading your newspapers, you're going to hear about gene chips and arrays and sequencing, but, but the era has now come upon us of full genome sequencing, where individuals get their entire genome sequenced. Now, the first genome cost about $3 billion. The second was Jim Watson's. It was somewhere under a million. Uh, at, a, at a meeting last week, we spoke with the individual who got his third genome done. It only cost 48000 and now they're costing 20000 and aiming at being about 3000 next year. 
So the plummeting price of gene sequencing is going to make full genomic sequence data available very soon. I'm going to come back to some of that implications, but suffice it to say that we can find mutations now with mind-boggling accuracy. Now, placing a mutation in the context of a gene-encoded functionally defined protein, like we were doing in the migraine situation, and this is just from one of our Academy of Sciences papers dealing with migraine, you can see how the machine got broken. It's like peeking under the hood and looking at the machine and seeing what went wrong. How did that molecular defect lead to the disease? So it starts giving you a different perspective. Now, it's not only useful in giving you a perspective on this one very rare form of the disease, but what I want to suggest to you, and again, I'm borrowing from our studies on migraine, is that we can have these very potent mutations that hit a gene hard enough to make the disease only based on the genes. But the environment, evolution, learned very quickly that the same targets that make the migraine mutations are very, very susceptible to very specific toxins. Venomous snakes, anemones, scorpions target the same mechanism. So you can make exactly the same molecular defect with an environmental toxic agent. The outcome is exactly the same. You've hit one molecular mechanism and you've made a disease process. But most important are these mixed, these, whoops, it still does that, are the mixed forms where you have an interaction between the genes and the environment. And that's most simply seen in what we call the pharmacogenetic syndromes, where only individuals who have a predisposition based on their genes are susceptible to a specific drug or environmental insult. Not everybody, if you don't have the right genetic background, the toxin won't bother you. If you don't see the toxin, the genetic background won't bother you. And another form of that kind of gene and environment interaction we can see where you don't have different sequence variations, but where the stress placed on a tissue changes the pattern, the levels of gene expression. And perhaps the simplest one to describe in this, what I call stress-induced mixed state, is in a failing heart. In heart failure, as the heart dilates, the stresses on those heart cells change the program of gene expression. That sets the stage for that heart to be susceptible to a fatal arrhythmia. And in fact, everybody who dies of heart failure dies from that arrhythmia. They don't die because they're not circulating the blood. So again, it's an interaction between the environment and the genes that leads to the ultimate outcome. And we see that really exemplified as the situation that allows us to understand what's going on in the complex polygenic diseases, where we have this interaction between the genes and the environment giving us this mixed input to make our disease. Whoops. Now, once you understand a relevant target, you can drop that into a pathway, into interactions with other proteins in a cell. Because perhaps you'll be clever enough to figure out a way to hit the machine that was directly broken. But it's much more likely that you're going to find a place to intervene in the pathway, or you'll find a drug that already exists that can interact in that pathway and allow you to restore the state back towards a homeostasis, towards a healthful balance. Now, with that background of why we want to know something about the genetic information, and to give you my perspective on it, I want to enter into some of the topics that have been hot button issues in the news. Probably the most recent issue has to do with the definition of what autism is. This has come about because there's the rewriting of the DSM manual, the diagnostic manual that is sort of the gold standard of what we call different diseases. And as they're going into the fifth edition, what has happened is the names like Asperger's syndrome or pervasive developmental disease, they've all been lumped together, if you will, into one name which just places them in a spectrum, the autism spectrum disorders. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. And what I want to say is that makes perfect sense to me, because I've already given you some indications of a spectrum of diseases. I want to, again, just revisiting one of my migraine genes, I want to show you again how you develop a spectrum of diseases, even just making different mutations 
in one gene. The same machine is being broken slightly differently 